Hello and welcome to Think Python Chapter 2. Let's work on some exercises. You can use this link to get to the notebooks. You can click here to run the notebook on Colab. But since we've already started in on Chapter 2, I'm going to go back to my existing notebook. And I see a message here that you're going to see. If you leave a Colab notebook unused for a little while, you can press Reconnect and it'll start up again. Okay, when you start the exercises, you're going to see a cell here that says X mode verbose, and remember that that tells Jupyter that when an exception happens or a runtime error happens, it should give you the full output so that you have all the information that you need. The first exercise in the chapter, again, gives you some suggestions about working with virtual assistants in a way that can help you with your learning, and if you get stuck on something, help you get unstuck. There are some examples here of questions that you might want to ask, topics that came up in the chapter that I might not have explained fully. One of them that I remember, and we can go up here to the upper right and click the Gemini button, to get access to their AI tool. And we could ask the question that came up in the chapter, which is, why are arguments called that? As the explanation here says, the argument is a value that's passed to a function. The term argument may have originated from mathematics, where it refers to a value that is provided to a function, but that doesn't really explain where it comes from. So I don't know. But there are other questions that you can ask, and there are some suggestions here for other questions that you might be interested in. I'm going to close this window now so we have some space to work with. I also make some suggestions here about making some deliberate errors so that you see what those error messages look like. So below this text cell, I'm going to create a new code cell and try the example here, which is 17 equals n, which looks like an assignment statement, but it's the other way around. It has the variable on the right and a value on the left. And let's see what happens if we try to run that. And it says syntax cannot assign to a literal here. Literal is a vocabulary word we haven't seen yet. It refers to any value that is part of the program itself like a number in this case, or a floating point value, or a string, those are literal values. And the thing on the left-hand side of an assignment statement has to be a variable name. It can't be a value or other kind of expression. It has to be a valid variable name. So that's why that's an error. All right, let's start in on the first exercise. These are some examples where we're going to use Python as a calculator, and we're going to take advantage of the variables that we learned about in this chapter. Here's an example computing the volume of a sphere. We have this mathematical equation, 4 thirds pi r squared, where r is the radius of the sphere, and we're going to compute the volume of a sphere with radius 5. The exercise gives us a couple of suggestions. It says we're going to create a variable that's named radius, and set that equal to 5. Now, as I work on exercises, I'm going to run the cell. Whenever I write a line of code, I'm going to test it immediately and make sure that it works, so that if there's an error there, I'm going to find that error sooner rather than later. OK. And then it says it's going to assign the result to a variable named volume. So I'm going to create a variable named volume. And this needs to be equal to 4 thirds pi r squared. So I'm going to write 4 divided by 3 times 3 times math dot pi times the radius squared. That looks pretty good. I need to think a little bit about the order of operations here. And remember that this exponentiation is going to happen first. And then Division and multiplication will happen from left to right. So this will be 4 divided by 3, and then multiplied by pi, and then multiplied by the result of that exponentiation. So that looks good. That's what I intend. I'm going to run this cell. And remember that I assigned this value to a variable, which means that I don't actually see the result. But if I now type the name of the variable as an expression, 
I'll see the result, and this says that the volume of a sphere with that radius is about 104.7. Looks good so far. Okay, on to number two. So this says, a rule of trigonometry says that for any value of x, the cosine of x squared plus the sine of x squared should be equal to 1, and we're going to see if that's true for a value of x like 42. So we'll create a variable named x, and we'll give it the value 42, and again I'm going to run that cell and just make sure that everything's correct. And then we'll use math.cosine to compute the cosine of x, and then we will square it using the exponentiation operator, and then we'll add in math.sine of x, and we'll square that. And if things have gone according to plan, the result should be 1. Good. And it's 1.0. Now, I suggested the value of 42, but I'll encourage you to try out a couple of other values, because you'll notice a couple of things. If I use a value that's substantially bigger than 42, sometimes we get a value that's not exactly 1. And if we choose a value for x that's pretty small, like 0 0.0001, yeah, let me try a couple more zeros. Sometimes we get a value that's not exactly 1. And this is a reminder that floating point arithmetic is not exactly correct, it's only approximately correct. And we'll see lots of examples of that. Okay, so that's the second part of the exercise. The third part says, in addition to pi, the other variable defined in the math module is e, which represents the base of the natural logarithm written in math notation as e. So we can use math.e, and that value is approximately 2.718. So if we want to raise e to a power, let's say we want to raise it to the power 2, we can use the exponentiation operator. We could also use math.pow and raise math.e to the second power. And there's one more option, which is that there is a math function called math.exp, which raises e to the given power. So if we call this function with the argument 2, the result is about 7.389. Now, notice one other thing, which is that the result from these three different ways of computing e squared is a little bit different. And again, that's a reminder that floating point numbers are only approximately correct. So that's it. Those are the exercises for Chapter 2. I'll see you next time in Chapter 3.